So welcome you all to you know, today's lecture. So what uh, we have been doing for the last couple of lectures is uh, we are studying the Bayes and Minimax Timis. So let's have a quick recap of what we were doing. So what we have uh, in any estimation problem is I have a risk function, R delta theta, for any estimator, theta. So an ideal situation would have been if I am able to find an estimator delta for which R delta theta is minimum at every theta belonging to capital theta. But then we realize that uh, that is not possible. So then we said that, OK, possibly the class of estimators under consideration is too big class. So I try to restrict the class of estimators. And then that's the way you studied uh, uniformly minimum variance and bias estimator, minimum risk invariant estimator. The other approach is uh, because we see that the whole problem is that this R delta theta is a function of a theta. It is a function. So finding a delta for which this function is minimum at every theta may not be possible because you can always choose decision rule deltas such as the constant estimators for which the risk is the minimum possible zero risk at one particular point. So at that point, no other estimator can minimize the risk except that constant estimator. So that's the main problem. The problem is because R delta theta is a function of a theta. So what we realized was that possibly rather than considering the risk function R delta theta for every theta, I try to consider some characteristic of a risk, of risk function which does not depend on theta. And then I try to optimize that characteristic which does not depend on theta. And that led to the concept of a Bayes estimator What it says is, uh, from the past experience, the statistician has certain belief, and he or she converts his belief in terms of a probability distribution, in terms of a randomness which is there in this unknown state of nature. So you have a probability distribution corresponding to theta. Now once you have a probability distribution corresponding to theta, which is we call as a prior distribution about the unknown state of nature, after data has been taken, one tries to update this prior information, which leads to the concept of a posterior distribution. So you have a prior distribution, which is, let us say, given by a prior pi. Then you have a posterior distribution, which is nothing but a updation of prior distribution after data has been taken. So what you try to do is, you try to consider the base risk, r pi delta, which is nothing but integral over theta, r theta delta, d pi theta. So that means you have considered, rather than the risk function, you have considered the average value of the risk function as theta is varying, according to the probability base of pi. Now this no longer depends on theta, so that means for every estimator delta, you have a constant quantity, which is its base risk. This prior distribution is fixed. Now it will be possible to find a base estimator. The another characteristic which said is sometimes it may make sense to talk about supremum of the risk, that means the maximum risk possible. And then you try to find an estimator which minimizes the maximum risk. So what you try to do is you consider supremum theta belonging to R delta theta. And then you try to find an estimator delta which minimizes this, and that is called minimax estimator. So what we uh, saw is uh, the posterior distribution is nothing but the PDF, let us say f of s, 
given x theta at x. So, it is a nothing but joint conditional period of, of s. Now, this theta is considered as a realization of s. So, th s is the random variable corresponding to the state of nature. So, this is a distribution of s given x. So, this is same as the joint distribution of s and x divided by marginal of x, but here x is fixed. So, marginal of x would be some constant quantity. So, it is proportional to the joint, but joint can be further written as f of x given theta and then f s theta. So, this can be written as is proportional to f theta x, which is basically the conditional distribution of x given theta or x given s is equal to theta into f s theta. So, this is the posterior distribution. Then what you realize is all the information about the unknown state of nature is contained in the posterior distribution because there were two sources of information. One was the prior distribution, one was the information contained in the data. So, you updated the prior information by incorporating data into it and that gave rise to posterior distribution. So, it looks like in the Bayesian framework, it is the posterior distribution which matters a lot. And then we saw that, in fact, that is the case. So, what is the Bayes action? Bayes action is the one which minimizes the posterior loss. So, expected value of S given X of L S. So, you try to minimize this respect to A. And then you say that base Xn is nothing but your base estimation. So, find, for finding a base estimator, what you need to do is you need to find a posterior distribution and then you try to minimize the posterior loss. And then we saw the loss functions. Uh, one is L theta A, let us say A minus psi theta of whole square. What is the base estimator here? We saw that. Something which minimizes this quantity with respect to posterior distribution. So, expected value of this with respect to posterior distribution. I know if I have to uh, consider expected value of psi S minus A whole square, that would be minimum only when A is the expected value of psi of S. That means it is the posterior expected value of psi s. So, it is a posterior mean similarly we considered uh, L 3 loss function as mod of a minus psi theta that means the absolute error. Now, in this case I have to minimize expected value of this psi of s a minus psi of s respect to posterior distribution of s given x. Then I know that absolute error is minimum when a is the median of the posterior distribution. So, that means in this case the base estimator delta pi x is nothing but posterior median. Then the third scenario which we considered was uh, L 2 theta a, let us say a by psi theta minus 1 whole square. Now, in this case, uh, what we saw was base estimator is nothing but expected value of s given x 1 by psi theta psi s divided by expected value of s given x 1 by psi square s. So, that is all we saw yesterday. Uh, yesterday, I also did one example uh, about the Poisson distribution and tried to find the base rules over there. Uh, uh, my, I'm afraid that I might have made certain calculation mistakes while doing it yesterday and possibly uh, the interpretations uh, which I gave were not very rigorous ones. So, let me repeat this example so that I can uh, uh, complete whatever deficiency was there in the arguments yesterday. So, let us say x1, x2, xn, iid, 
Poisson theta. So P theta means Poisson theta. My estimate is suppose theta. One can consider theta to power m, but let me just for simplicity consider psi theta is equal to theta. And uh, loss functions. So I can consider two loss functions, let us say L1 theta A is A minus theta whole square. Let me consider another loss function L2 theta A as A by theta minus 1 whole square. So these uh, uh, basically the first part is this and under this I know the base estimator would be nothing but posterior mean. In this case, which is of the third, second form, L2, I know the posterior of expected value of 1 by s divided by posterior expected value of 1 upon s square will give me the base estimator. So in either case, I have to find what is the posterior distribution. But before that, let us fix the prior distribution. I said my prior distribution suppose is nothing but e to power minus theta by nu, theta to power alpha minus 1 by nu to power alpha, gamma alpha, or theta positive. So it is a gamma prior. So let us consider uh, the posterior distribution. Posterior distribution means f of s given x, s at the point theta, and capital X at the point x. Now I know that this is proportional to the joint. And what is the joint? Joint of x given s, when x is x and s is theta, so that is same as f theta x. Multiplied by marginal of s at the point theta. So it is the basically joint of s and x at the point x and theta, which is further proportional to, I will leave all the constants involved over there. I just write down all the factors which involve theta only. So f theta x is nothing but product i is equal to 1 to n, because x1, x2, xn are iid poison theta. So x1, x2, xn are iid poison theta, so that means their joint PMF would be the product i is equal to 1 to n, e to power minus theta, theta to power xi. If you want, you can write down factorial xi for the time being. Uh, so in fact, then it will become exactly equal to this. into fs theta. fs theta we have taken to be gamma, which is e to power minus theta by nu, theta to power alpha minus 1 by nu to power alpha. So I retain only the factors of theta because here x is a constant. And in fact, your x is x1, x2, xn. Each xi is a poison, so it can take value 0, 1, 2, and so on. So x, which is x1, x2, xn, this takes value 0, 1, 2, n, sorry, 0, 1, 2, so on, power n. So this is a Cartesian product. x1 takes value 0 to n, x2 takes value 0 to n, and xn takes value 0 to n. Sorry, 0 to uh, any, any positive, uh, any non-negative integer. So what does this give? This will give e to power minus n theta, and also that gives me e to the power minus n plus 1 by nu theta. So this all we did yesterday. Then theta to the power summation xi plus alpha minus 1. This gets absorbed in the normalizing factor, constant. This is constant. This is constant. So in fact, I see that this is again of the gamma type. And in fact, now I can determine what would be the normalizing factor. So I got exactly the posterior distribution. So 
f of s given x, theta given x, turns out to be, what would be the normalizing factor? So, n plus nu, 1 by nu to power summation x i plus alpha divided by gamma of summation x i plus alpha e to power minus n plus 1 by nu theta, theta to power summation x i plus alpha minus 1. Now, under the loss function, which is square error, we have seen the base estimator would be the posterior mean. So, under L1, the base estimator is nothing but expected value of S given X of S. So, that means the mean of this distribution. And mean of this distribution is how much? Yeah? Mean of this distribution would be there, summation xi. So, I am now denoting everything small xi by random variables. Summation xi plus alpha divided by n plus 1 by nu. So, that is the base estimator. And look at in normal, normal circumstances, either uh, if you look at the UMV, UMV is summation xi by n. So, in general, constant time x bar can be considered to be a reasonable estimator. So, this goes to, as alpha goes to 0, summation xi upon n plus 1 by nu. Now, let us look at what is the interpretation of alpha going to 0. If I take alpha going to 0 in the prior, what does it say? First, let us look at what is the mean and variance of s. Mean is alpha times nu. Variance is alpha times nu square. So, if alpha goes to 0, mean goes to 0 in the prior distribution and variance also goes to 0. So, that means alpha is going to 0 depicts a situation where mean goes to 0, variance goes to 0. That means your random variable is degenerated 0. So, this is a situation where you are saying that your prior distribution theta is kind of a degenerate which has no information. So, in fact, that information is a very vague information. So, in that case, you estimated by the usual estimator, which is summation x i. So, this some constant time x bar, right? x bar, this would be n x bar upon n plus 1 by nu. Okay, now let us look at what happens under L2. Under L2, what I know is delta pi x is nothing but expected value of s given x of 1 upon s divided by expected value of s given x by 1 upon s square, right? This is what we saw in the example. Okay, so now the posterior distribution is given over here. I have to find only expected value of 1 upon s and expected value of 1 upon s square for this PDF and I get the base estimator. So, from the gamma integral, you know that if I put this integral 0 to infinity 1 upon theta, so it becomes some an xi plus alpha minus 1. So, it would be the same quantity. So, this would be a summation xi plus alpha divided by gamma. And when I have put 1 by theta over here, it becomes summation xi plus alpha minus 1. So, except the same thing would come over here, except that alpha becomes alpha minus 1. And n plus 1 by nu, just from the gamma integral, sorry, alpha minus 1. 
Now, when I'm talking about expected load volume upon a square, same thing, n plus 1 by nu to the power summation xi plus alpha by gamma xi plus alpha into gamma. Now, here it becomes now summation xi plus alpha minus 2 because 1 upon theta square would come and that would be quit summation xi plus alpha minus 2 minus 1. In fact, there was no need to put this. This is gets cancelled. And what you are left with is this gamma xi plus alpha minus 1 in summation xi plus alpha. So that becomes summation xi plus alpha minus 2. And then it gets cancelled with this. And then n plus 1 by nu, which is again something nx bar plus some constant. Of course, note that for here, movements to exist, I have a 1 upon theta square, so theta summation xi plus alpha minus 2. Summation xi can be take, can take value 0 also. So for this gamma integral to exist, alpha minus 2 should be positive for every x if I want. So that is why in this case you choose alpha such that alpha is greater than 2. Okay, so this was the example about uh, the Poisson case, and you know how to find out the Bayes estimator. Basically, every time you have to find a Bayes estimator, you have to minimize the posterior risk. Then we talked about uh, sometimes it may make sense to consider improper priors. And what were the improper priors? That means the total integral is infinite. Or in other words, pi is not a probability measure. Note that any measure for which integral over whole theta of d pi theta is finite, that can be converted into a probability measure by dividing it by whatever is the total area under pi. Because I take, if it was c, I bring it 1 upon c, I consider measure to be pi upon c then the total integral is 1. So for me, finite measure or probability measure, in certain sense, mathematically at least they are equivalent. So improper prior is integral of d pi theta is infinity, and we saw that in certain situations it may be appropriate or it may be appealing to take improper priors. So for example, we saw that in normal theta 1, suppose theta is known to be lying in the open interval a, b, and you don't want, you want to have a non-informative prior. Non-informative prior in the sense that theta, you don't have any preferences for one theta over the other theta. Or in other words, you assume that theta is uniformly distributed on the interval a to b. But uniform distribution is only defined in finite intervals. So if normal theta 1, and I have to consider prior of theta in the whole real line. I should see what is the corresponding thing in the real lines which satisfies the properties of a uniform distribution. And characteristic of uniform distribution is the weight it gives to any interval only depends on the length of the interval. And it does not depend on where that interval is located. And that is exactly the property of a Lebesgue measure, which is nothing but a length of an interval. So that way, if I have to talk about whole real line in the normal case, Lebesgue measure may be a proper prior distribution. Then we say that, OK, one can talk about uh, uh, finding Bayes rule under improper press. And we call such a Bayes rules to be generalized Bayes rules. So sometimes generalized Bayes rules may come naturally, and they may have certain appeal. For example, even in this case, when alpha was going to 0, I was not getting a proper prior distribution. I was getting 1 upon theta, but which has its own appeal. So uh, to cover Bayesian analysis in a more general setup, we also consider improper press. 
Okay, so what we have to do is uh, uh, even when you are not able to find best estimators, you would like to get rid of some estimators, to which I call as inadmissible estimators. Inadmissible means which are not admissible. And when will you call an estimator to be inadmissible? Provided there is a better candidate than the given estimator. A better candidate than the given estimator means I can find an estimator whose risk is always less than or equal to that quantity for every theta. And at some theta, there is a strict inequality. So that gives the definition of an inadmissible estimator. An estimator delta is said to be inadmissible inadmissible for estimating sin theta under a given loss function if there exists an estimator delta star says that the risk of delta star is always less than or equal to now this would not satisfy because there is a possibility that both are same then I cannot say it is inadmissible there should be a strict inequality at least at one point so and r theta dot delta star is strictly less than r theta naught delta for some theta naught plus delta. So very natural way of defining inadmissible estimator. So suddenly any estimator which is inadmissible should not be considered, right? Because given that estimator, you have found an estimator whose risk is always less than or equal to the risk of that estimator delta. And in fact, at some point, it is smaller. Now, uh, we loosely call this phenomenon by saying that delta star dominates delta. Delta star dominates. That means risk of delta star is always less than or equal to risk of delta at every theta. And at some theta, there is a strict inequality. OK, now the question is, then what are the admissible estimator? So, best way to define admissible estimator is any estimator which is not inadmissible is said to be admissible. An estimator is said to be admissible. if it is not inadmissible. What does that mean? That means if there is an estimator delta star for which this happens, then you cannot have a strict inequality at any theta. So that means if this happens, then the risk of delta star has to be same as risk of delta for every theta if for any estimator delta star with r theta delta star is less than or equal to r theta delta. If this happens, it will not be inadmissible. So that means this would imply we have r theta delta star should be same as r theta delta for every theta. Because if there is a strict inequality at some theta, it will become inadmissible. But it is not inadmissible. So that's a very simple definition, mathematical definition of admissibility. Suddenly, from the definitions, it is clear that any inadmissible estimator 
should not be considered because you can always find a estimator which dominates the given admissible estimator. The question is, are admissible estimators reasonable estimators? Note that admissibility only ensures that you don't have an estimator which dominates that admissible estimator at every theta. There's a possibility that it dominates at all the point theta except at one point. And at that point, that given estimator has the smallest possible risk. Then it will not be inadmissible. Although it gets dominated at all other points of theta except at one single point, as it happens with the constant estimator. So what we are going to see is admissible estimators need not be good estimators. <laughs>